Good morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Glad to be with you on today, the 15th day of December, 2018. A lot of stuff we're going to get into in the world of baseball, sports, and unified America. I'll put out a little two-minute sound clip of basically the shortened version of how I feel about baseball's Hall of Fame. And it's funny, coming after the winter meetings, I think a lot of the attention and the focus tends to be on player movement and what type of moves teams are going to make and whether it was a busy setup with a lot of things going on. Though I believe that there wasn't a whole lot of actual signings and activity, I do believe there's a lot of groundwork. And I would expect a week like next week, as we get close to Christmas, and I do think with the holidays coming up, I, I believe that a lot of people, uh, a lot of organizations and teams and stuff like that are not going to want to go out of their way to have things hanging around the holidays. So I, I, I do would, would expect the early part of next week to be a very busy series of, of um, you know, moves and stuff going on in the world of baseball, but uh, obviously, you had the Hall of Fame announcement, which came from the Veterans Committee. And the easiest thing to do, and once again, sometimes your gut reaction is just to say something obvious and essentially just repeating what everybody in the crowd does. And that's not what I ever want to stand for and whatever I, what, what, what I want to do. Harold Baines, I think, is a marginal Hall of Fame candidate at best. And it doesn't mean that once it's said and done, once he, you know, he's inducted into ceremonies, that he doesn't belong. Because once he's in, he's in. I think of a guy by the name of Rabbit Marinville, who played in the early part in the dead ball era and a little bit in the live ball era as a shortstop with the Boston Braves and a handful of other teams. And he stood out because he only hit two fifty eight for his career. He played 23 seasons. He was known as a very good defensive shortstop, probably one of the elite defensive players of that time, and ends up being inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame posthumously after he died in the late 1950s. And you think of other players like Ray Schalk and Bill Mazeroski, who may very well be in the Hall of Fame just because of the home run that he hit in the 1960 World Series to help to win it for the Pittsburgh Pirates over the New York Yankees. Phil Rizzuto is one MVP award, but outside of that was never considered a dominant player when it comes to Major League Baseball. You could even make a hard argument, if you want, against Jack Morris. Jack Morris was a very good postseason pitcher, but was really average when it came down to his stats, his ability. You know, He didn't have a ridiculously high winning percentage um, he had a high earned run average, but was a throwback pitcher. was a guy that was going to pitch nine innings regardless. So it's a little bit of a tougher argument than some of the players that I mentioned before. But when it comes down to it, you, know, you look at a guy like Harold Baines who did pass the longevity test. He stuck around, and he was an integral player for the better part of the 1980s and 1990s. The thing that stands out about him and those that want to knock Harold Baines and his Hall of Fame credentials will say that he was never amongst the top in the sport. He spent more than half of his career as a designated hitter. We've watched as certain players like Frank Thomas and likely Edgar Martinez this year who have spent more of their careers as a designated hitter probably get the consideration and the opportunity to be in the Hall of Fame that they deserve. So I think Baines getting in, it you know, almost makes it clearer that a guy like David Ortiz, unless he's held back because of rumors about the use of performance enhancing drugs, which is something we're going to get into in a little bit, unfortunately, designated hitters have their place in baseball's Hall of Fame. And the easiest thing to say is that the Veterans Committee made a mistake with Harold Baines, but I'm not going to blame it on the Veterans Committee. Because I think this is a process that's been flawed from the beginning. And a game that, for many different reasons, and these reasons could be considered very respectable, they could be considered legitimate reasons, but all in all, you're looking at a game that has chosen, for many different reasons, to exclude the top players 
and some of the best players to ever play in its sport. Now you want to say the players did it to themselves, those who chose to take performance-enhancing drugs or ended up getting themselves implicated within the use of performance-enhancing drugs or those that bet on baseball or were involved in the Black Sox scandal. Like we'll talk about Shoeless Joe Jackson in a couple minutes. You could say that that's all fair information and valid within the discussion. But the bottom line is you put it all together and you have what has become an embarrassment to all professional sports and all of professional sports Hall of Fames. Baseball separates itself from football, basketball, and hockey in many positive ways. It's considered America's pastime, America's game, as American as the blues, as American as apple pie. Major League Baseball and baseball in general is considered that. But if it wants to separate itself from the other sports, it's having a hard time catching up to now the popularity of the NFL, which ironically, if you're going to talk about the Black Sox sandal and talk about Pete Rose, the popularity of the NFL has a lot to do with gambling. But the problem is this. The NBA, the NFL, the NHL honors every one of the best players to ever play its game. Some of them may not be Hall of Fame people, but they are Hall of Fame players based off of their performance on the field and what they accomplished. So you say, how do I tie Harold Baines getting inducted in the Hall, the Hall of Fame in baseball by the Veterans Committee to the fact that the best players in all of Major League Baseball have not been enshrined. And here's the reason. You get to a point where the baseball writer's credibility is taking a hit. It's becoming a popularity contest. It's becoming a judgment based off of what the writers think of that individual as a person. And those that those writers that I know and those writers that I respect will respectfully come back at me and saying, hey, there is a character clause. Now, is there a character clause in all the other major sports in their Hall of Fame? I haven't heard it stated in that way. But if there is, still the best of the best are enshrined in its respective Hall of Fames. So when you have baseball, which obviously is holding people back because of potential mistakes that they made, in some cases mistakes that aren't even proven, you judge and you say that this player is not in a Hall of Fame because they use steroids, yet in some cases there's no proof that this player actually took the steroids. And there really is no clause to say for entertainment in any major sport that you can't use steroids or you can't have used steroids at some point of your life and never been caught or acknowledged that you did that. Obviously, the drug testing policies exist in sports now. So if a player is caught using PEDs, they get suspended accordingly in baseball and football, and certainly basketball and hockey as well. But this is something that Major League Baseball, once again, dropped the ball on years ago. Bud Selig, who comes out as if he led the crusade against the use of performance-enhancing drugs, turned his eye to the use of steroids as they were running ramp rampant in the late 1990s when Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were you know, patting each other on the back and hugging before the game as they're getting ready to break Roger Maris's home run record. A couple of years later, Barry Bonds doing the same thing. And you know, the question was, could Barry Bonds do it? Could he get to 70 home runs in a season? And after that, it became, can Barry Bonds eclipse Hank Aaron and his all-time home run record. And he went out there and did it. And these were all things that were very special and the fans embraced it. They did. The fans came out and couldn't wait to see if, it, if Mark McGuire was going to hit home run number 62. When he got there later on in the season, was Sammy Sosa going to pass 61 as well? Was Mark McGuire going to get to 70 in the season? In 2001, could Barry Bonds actually hit more than 70 home runs in a season? And then when it came down to it, could Barry Bonds possibly eclipse the mighty Henry Aaron and his all-time home run record? These were all things that the fans got behind and supported and loved. And now you look at the baseball writers who 
for the most part, like I said, I respect a good amount of them. There's a lot of them I know personally, and there's a lot of them that I, I, I have a ton of respect for in their opinions. But they've taken this a little bit too far. By changing the game, by essentially telling the fans and the people that are following the Hall of Fame and its museum that they should essentially forget about a time that happened in baseball in the late 1980s and the 1990s and the early part of 2000, as if that part of baseball history doesn't exist, is a mistake. And because of that, the Veterans Committee has come out in droves. The players that are involved with the Veterans Committee, the executives that are involved in the Veterans Committee, are obviously not in agreement with the jobs that the writers have been doing when it comes to electing players in the Baseball's Hall of Fame. Alan Trammell fell considerably short in his last year of eligibility for the Baseball Hall of Fame by the writers. The Veterans Committee said, screw that. We're putting him in the first time the chance that we get. Jack Morris, 15 years on the ballot. He didn't have enough votes to get in. First chance that the Veterans Committee gets, they put them in. So it's almost like an undermining factor that is involved with this. And because the baseball writers, and I hate to say it, they haven't been doing their job. I mean, you look at a guy like Kurt Schilling. Kurt Schilling is held out of baseball's Hall of Fame, or at least held from creating the possible the, the, the momentum that's necessary to get towards a spot in baseball's Hall of Fame. He's held back because... Of his attitude. Because he doesn't like the writers. He's actually standing up for what he believes in. So the writers say, hey, you don't like us. We don't like you. We're not going to put you in. The politics that is involved in the Baseball Hall of Fame writing process is an absolute joke. It's something that should change. And maybe over time, we should have to look at the voting process and see if maybe it should change. Maybe there should be more players involved. Maybe the actual members of the Baseball Hall of Fame should be able to have a vote, and have a vote mean something in regards to the players that get elected each year. Because once you're in, you, you become an expert on what a Baseball Hall of Famer should be. Whether you made, you made it marginally, whether you made it without a doubt, whether you made it because of a little politics involved. I respect those that are in baseball's Hall of Fame and their judgment and their ability to judge who should be in and who shouldn't be in. The baseball writers are not doing their job. And it's a shame. Because of that, the Veterans Committee is almost overcompensating. And I believe they did here. And that's as far as I'll go when it comes to Harold Baines. Because Harold Baines had a very good career. Now, you say, hey, he's a borderline Hall of Fame candidate at best. But he gets in... Because the Veterans Committee is overcompensating for the fact that the baseball writers of today are not doing their job. And that's an embarrassment. It is. There's actually another entity out there that's voting for the Baseball Hall of Fame and is probably doing it in a different way. Because they feel like they have to counteract the fact that the baseball writers are not doing their job. They're trying to find a reason for players to not be in the Hall of Fame as opposed to find and judge the reasons that they should be in the Hall of Fame. It's not the Hall of Inclusion, it's the Hall of Exclusion. What other sport has the equivalent? And obviously when we're talking about stats in Major League Baseball, they're not the same in football, they're not the same in basketball, they're not the same in hockey. But when I make these following statements, you'll understand exactly what it is that I'm talking about. You know I'm not talking about home runs as they apply to football, basketball, and hockey. You know I'm talking about the equivalent to home runs as they apply to football, basketball, and hockey. Which other one of the major sports has the player that has the most hits in its history? Not in the Hall of Fame. What other sport has the player that hit the most home runs in it, the history of its sport? Not in the Hall of Fame. Which sport has... Two of the top four highest batting averages accumulated in major league in, in baseball history, not in its Hall of Fame. What play what sport has the player that has the most MVP awards? Not in its Hall of Fame. What sport has the player that has accomplished the MVP for pitching, the Cy Young Awards, the most Cy Young Awards, not in its respective Hall of Fame? What 
sport has one of only four players to have 4,000 strikeouts in the history of its sport, not in its Hall of Fame? The answer is baseball. And at some point, the baseball writers, and it's, I hate to say it, I'm a big fan of Jeff Idelson, but at some point, the Baseball Hall of Fame is going to have to answer to why the best of the best aren't enshrined in its Hall of Fame and why there's so much politics involved in baseball and its Hall of Fame. Because I don't think that's fair to the people that follow the game. It's not fair to its fans. It's not fair to those that are investing the money in, in the uh, everything involved in the sport, which includes going to the Hall of Fame. So I think it's an embarrassment and one that has finally had some ramifications. And if you want to blame anybody else for Harold Baines being inducted in the Hall of Fame, you're crazy if you're not blaming the baseball writers. The baseball writers have forced the Veterans Committee to almost counteract what it is that the baseball writers are doing. Almost act as a separate entity and judging their voting process completely different than the baseball writers have. And who's to blame for that? The baseball writers for not doing their job. Just a reminder that this copyright and broadcast is authorized under internet rights, granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for the entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPielli.com, and John Pielli LLC is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of a program, such as by charging admission for its showing, is similarly prohibited. Stick into baseball. Um, if you think about Joe Jackson and his story, which we spoke about on the earlier show in the week, we're not going to repeat it. We're not going to get back into what it is that we spoke about in regards to Joe Jackson. Obviously, I believe he belongs in baseball's Hall of Fame. I think he should be forgiven. He uh, was almost done playing up. Uh, hundred years ago. And I think when we talk about pardons that are given out, let's say, by the president, you know, you could pardon Joe Jackson and give him the opportunity to have the voters vote on his merit, even against the backstory of what he was involved with, with the 1919 Black Sox scandal. And obviously, you're talking about the Chicago White Sox of that year being such a dominant force so heavily favorited in the World Series against the Cincinnati Reds. And the gamblers got involved and they convinced players on the Chicago White Sox team to throw the World Series. Now, my thought behind this for years has been that this wasn't the first time that a World Series was thrown. Unfortunately, it gained the attention it did because it was proven at least from players that were involved that admitted to their involvement in the fixing. Now, you saw, guys, obviously the big wigs when it comes to the gamblers be known throughout the sport for a series of years. There were players that were throwing games that were held accountable at certain times or at least called out for throwing games. But there was never another World Series prior to 1919 that had substantial information that exists that said that it could be could have been thrown. And I've said all along, when it comes to the history of the World Series, going back to the year of 1903, that the greatest upset in the history of World Series baseball happened in 1914, when the miracle Boston Braves beat the mighty Philadelphia Athletics and Connie Mack and a $100,000 infield. And of course, the $100,000 infield featured home run Baker and Jack Barry, Eddie Collins and Stuffy McGinnis. They had Eddie Plank as their top pitcher, Chief Bender. They, they obviously had a superior team to anybody, not just in the American League, but in all of Major League Baseball. The Boston Braves were 10 and a half games out of first place in the National League at the end of July. They went on a ridiculous run, finished the season strong, and were a surprise winner of the National League pennant that season. As the World Series came out, it was thought to just be a, a quick run. The Athletics, who had won the World Series three of the last four years, in 1910, 11, and 13, 
The American League had won the World Series for the last four years and seemed to dominate the National League. So the Boston Braves come in there with the great Johnny Evers, and Johnny Evers, of course, remembered from that old poem, Tinker to Evers to Chance, with the Chicago Cubs who had won the World Series in 1908. Uh, Hank Gowdy was their catcher, had a great World Series, probably would have been the World Series MVP if voting had taken place back then. The Braves come out there and in a very surprising fashion, not only beat the Philadelphia Athletics in the World Series, but sweep them in four games. And I, I always had the two different aspects of this that I studied when I was looking at it. Number one, you can't talk about the 69 Mets. You can't talk about the 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates. You can't talk about the 1990 Cincinnati Reds or the 1988 Brooklyn Dodgers. When you're talking, I'm sorry, the Los Angeles Dodgers, when you're talking about the biggest upsets in the history of the World Series, there's only one. One stands out by a mile by itself, and that's the 1914 Boston Braves. They had no business even showing up and being on the same field as those mighty Philadelphia Athletics. And it was in the history of the World Series, as we have gone, gone on for about 115 years since the inception of it, it's the greatest upset in the history of World Series play. So the other aspect, you see what happened five years later with the Black Sox scandal almost destroying baseball, and could there have been enough of a judgment or at least enough information that could have existed that could put any evidence towards a possible fix in the 1914 World Series? Now, historians contend that there was a little bit of animosity towards Connie Mack. Now, Connie Mack himself obviously would have had no involvement. There's no doubt that Connie Mack would never have stooped to that level. He was considered the gentleman of all gentlemen. He asked that his players not only engage, not only to not engage in any negative type of activity, but also asked that they never swore or never spoke in a derogatory tone. So Connie Mack, I leave him out, but Connie Mack has an involvement because of the frustration of the players that are on that team. Connie Mack, living towards a similar budget that you saw Charlie Comiskey follow, was very cheap in regards to his operations of a team. And remember, not only was Connie Mack the manager, but he was also the owner. So he's penny pinching, doing everything he can to try to save money. And that didn't rub off very well on his players. By the way, the same players that essentially were all shipped out by the 1916 season. And the Philadelphia Athletics of 1916 had one of the worst records and worst winning percentages of all time in baseball history. So you put that all together and maybe there was some animosity that existed amongst the players of that Philadelphia Athletic team. Now, there was, at least reported, that there was some interaction with gamblers on that World Series. And this doesn't get mentioned very often. And here's one thing that I actually have to read here because it, it noted that there were players that were noticed over the course of that season, if not in the World Series, that did not play hard for Connie Mack and were irritated at his penny pension ways. Also, there was a heavy wager against Philadelphia placed on the World Series placed by entertainer George M. Cohen through bookmaker Sports Sullivan. And if the name Sports Sullivan doesn't ring a bell to you, it should if you talk about his association and involvement in a 1919 Black Sox scandal. He was involved. So here's a guy five years earlier showing his face up and having a, a major entertainer that is a very good public figure and is very well known in Philadelphia placing a very heavy bet against the Philadelphia Athletics. After that season, Chief Bender and Eddie Plank, the top pitchers on the Philadelphia Athletics staff, jumped to the rival Federal League. They couldn't wait to get out. They couldn't wait to leave Philadelphia. They couldn't wait to play in a different form of organized professional baseball. Mac 
after that season, started shipping out his players. And actually, i got to correct myself, the Athletics of 1916 had the worst winning percentage in all of baseball history, and actually the worst since the 1899 Cleveland Spiders, who you know they essentially just lost games on purpose. So there is some smoke to the fact that the 1914 World Series could have been thrown by the Philadelphia Athletics. And once again, a lot of it is spoken through the respect that baseball has for Connie Mack. And he deserves all the credit that he, that he got. He managed and owned the team for 50 years. He was considered to his last day one of the most uh, genuine gentlemen in the sport. But also was a businessman. And he wasn't afraid to ship off players if he thought that the potential they had was to make more money than he was willing to pay. He did the same thing after winning the World Series in 1929 and 1930 with the likes of Jimmy Fox and Mickey Cochran. And it's unfortunate that that, that happened that way. But it's the facts. This is a guy that was known as a businessman first, even though he's also known as one of the sweethearts of Major League Baseball. But because he doesn't have that adversarial presence that a Charlie Comiskey had, and think about it, if you saw Eight Men Out, if you've seen any documentary about the 1919 Black Sox, Charlie Comiskey plays a very negative figure, almost a jerk, almost like he may not have hated his players, but wanted to do everything he can to hold them back. Didn't want to launder their clothes. And obviously launder, I'm not talking about money laundering, I'm talking about laundry. He didn't want to wash their clothes or he didn't want to pay for the cleaning of their clothes. So that's why they were known as the Black Sox. Eddie Seacott, who was held back and rested for two weeks in a season, ends up falling one win short of winning 30, which would have gotten him a bonus. Charlie Comiskey obviously arranged that that didn't happen, so he didn't have to pay him. Connie Mack doesn't have that same reputation, but history shows that he did have some penny pension ways, and that rubbed off negatively on the players that were on that team. So, and when we talk about 1919 as the only time in Major League Baseball history a World Series was thrown, I think you have to go back five years earlier and talk about something that seemed almost too good to be true. The Boston Braves, who didn't belong on the same field as the mighty Philadelphia Athletics, and in the history of the Baseball World Series, had the biggest upset in the entire history of the sport. Maybe it was too good to be true. This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer that costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive Beechwood Aging produces a taste, a smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no beer at any cost. So I did want to touch on this because this was something I was thinking about. When it comes down to it, sometimes the simple confusing or the confusing nature of somebody's name can make you think of somebody that's completely different. You know, if you're referring to John Adams, the president, you may be referring to John Quincy Adams, but a lot of times people and historians will make sure that they refer to the second president as John Quincy Adams. Obviously, President George Bush, who just passed away, is known as George Herbert Walker Bush or 41 and obviously his son, George Bush, George W. Bush, is known as W or 43. So we, we try to do distinct things to make sure that we can tell the difference between people that have similar enough names. Apparently that doesn't apply to the NBA. There was a trade involving the Phoenix Suns and the Houston Rockets. And a third team, the Memphis Grizzlies, were involved. And it would have sent Trevor Ariza. And he would have been involved in that trade. Now, the negotiation was held between the Houston Rockets and the Phoenix Suns and the Memphis Grizzlies who were there. They were involved. They were going to be part of this trade. We're not exactly involved with the players that were being thrown around. So it was assumed that Houston and Phoenix had understood where Memphis was coming from and what their angle of this trade was. 
and it fall, fell apart because of one simple last name and the fact that there are two players on the Memphis Grizzlies that have the same last name, Brooks. There's Marshawn Brooks and there's Dylan Brooks. Marshawn Brooks, if you remember, was a first-round draft pick of the Boston Celtics in, what is it, 2011? Ended up going and playing for the New Jersey and Brooklyn Nets. Was an integral part of their team for a little while. Actually spent the last three years not playing in the NBA. Came back, signed with the Memphis Grizzlies, and he's part of their team right now. Dylan Brooks, a second-round draft pick of, ironically, the Houston Rockets in 2017. Obviously, he's a little bit younger. So, the Memphis Grizzlies thought they were trading Marshawn Brooks, and the Phoenix Suns thought they were getting Dylan Brooks, and that's why this trade ends up fizzling and ends up being broken down, and there's really nothing left to it. It's done. And it made me think of a current Bulls head coach by the name of Jim Boylan. And his track record, if you go back to 1987, he was an assistant head coach at Michigan State. He was an assistant head coach in the NBA with the Houston Rockets, Golden State Warriors, Milwaukee Bucks, and then once again with Michigan State. He ended up getting the head coaching job at the University of Utah where afterwards he ended up going back to the NBA where he was an assistant coach with the Indiana Pacers, the San Antonio Spurs, the Chicago Bulls, and then this year getting elevated to the head coaching position. His last name is spelled B-O-Y-L-E-N. There's another Jim Boylan. His name is spelled B-O-Y-L-A-N. He's been a head coach, I'm sorry, an assistant head coach in professional basketball and in college since 1982. Last year, he was let go by the Cleveland Cavaliers um, in a spot where he contested it. He probably thought he was entitled to more money, whatever. Uh, a story that's not really worth telling, but the bottom line is he is no longer a coach or an assistant coach in the NBA. He started at Bevy College, went to, ironically, Michigan State, where he was also an assistant coach, was the head coach at New Hampshire, was a scout for the Cleveland Cavaliers, an assistant head coach for the Vancouver Grizzlies, the Phoenix Suns, the Atlanta Hawks, and the Chicago Bulls. And guess what? He also was the head coach of the Chicago Bulls. He went. He was an assistant head coach with the Milwaukee Bucks, became the head coach of the Milwaukee Bucks, and was an assistant coach for the Cleveland Cavaliers, before being relieved of his duties at the end of last season. So you'd understand why, if the name Jim Boylan is thrown out there, it's easy to confuse him. It's easy to confuse two guys that essentially coached in the same spots, and their names are pronounced the same, and there's only one letter in their name that could show any difference between the two of them. Obviously a little harder to do that than decipher between two presidents, whether we're talking about the Bushes or the Adams. But I think it's ironic, I was thinking about talking about the Boylans and their differences, and obviously you had the thing happen last night with the trade that was supposed to happen involving Trevor Ariza, and how that falls because of a last name of a player. Memphis Grizzlies thought they were giving up Marshawn Brooks, they were really supposed to give up Dylan Brooks, that's what the Phoenix Suns were expecting, and that deal fell through very quickly. So just kind of funny how that worked out. This is a time of the show where we remind you that Castrol provides maximum protection against viscosity and thermal breakdown. This is the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Time to get into today's NFL picks. And we decided to do the show a little bit earlier today because obviously there are a couple games today. I'm not going to bet on either one of them. You got a 425 game with the Jets playing, and then you got a game later on tonight with uh, Denver. I'm decided to stay away from both of those games. But the first game I'm going to hit up pretty hard is Sunday, 1 p.m. You got the Washington Redskins going to Jacksonville to face the Jacksonville Jaguars. And what was at one point one of the great stories in the National Football League this year 
you know, has now really become a sad story. It's a story that almost seems as if their, the rug was pulled out from under them. And you think about the Washington Redskins, they seem to be poised and on pace to win the National League, I'm sorry, the NFC East Division. And obviously the injuries to Alex Smith and then Colt McCoy have kind of compromised their season. Mark Sanchez was a starting quarterback last week, didn't last very long. Josh Johnson, similar to Sanchez, is off the street a couple weeks before, ends up guiding their offense a little bit better in an embarrassing loss to the New York Giants. Listen, I know football is not really a game of momentum. Each game is held differently to different standards. But I have a hard time expecting Josh Johnson, who doesn't know that Washington Redskins offense, to go out there and lead them past a good Jacksonville Jaguar defense. The Jacksonville Jaguars have had their own issues this year. A team that was just a win away from making it to the Super Bowl, representing the AFC and beating the New England Patriots, has been a huge disappointment this year. They have a quarterback controversy of their own with Cody Kessler now starting in favor of the well-compensated Blake Bortles. Doug Marone, as the head coach, could very well be on a hot seat, maybe out after this season. We'll see how it ends up working out. Obviously, Jacksonville, high expectations, letting people down, including their own fans, with the, rec- with the record where it sits right now. I like Jacksonville today, this, this Sunday. Seven and a half point favorites. I think they're going to blow out the Washington Redskins. Give me Jacksonville minus seven and a half at home against Washington. Game number two, I think this will be a very good game. Also Sunday, 1 p.m., the Dallas Cowboys traveling in Indianapolis against the Colts. And I think the Cowboys are in the proper position to win the NFC East Division. That win against Philadelphia put them in the driver's seat. And I think if they could win against Indianapolis, they could just about run away with it. The Colts are fighting for a playoff spot in their own. They've gotten great play this year from Andrew Luck, which co- you know, coincidentally has everything to do with the play of their offensive line. Quentin Nelson, their first-round draft pick, has been a star. And I remember Paul Dettino telling Mike Sanfilippo and myself on Game Over that if there was one player in last year's draft that was expected to be a Hall of Famer, it was Quentin Nelson. And that offensive line in Indianapolis has done a great job. Dallas has has played very well over the last couple weeks to get themselves in a position that they are. I think they're up for a little bit of a letdown. Now, the Dallas defense, which you've seen dominate the likes of the New Orleans Saints, I think you're when you're thinking about the keys to victory for the Cowboys, can they get to Andrew Luck? Can they keep Luck from performing as well as he has over the course of this season? I like the line, the Colts playing at home, get, given three points. So give me the Colts minus three at home against the Dallas Cowboys. Game number three, um, we're going to move on to Sunday at 425, and it's the game of the week. It features the New England Patriots and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the Patriots are, are in a spot where they've shown some vulnerability at points this year, or obviously coming off of a almost an embarrassing loss in Miami against the Miami Dolphins. Just a uh, essential Hail Mary type of play where they got players, including Rob Gronkowski, sitting there at safety. They couldn't make the tackle. The Dolphins score, and they end up winning the game as the clock runs out. I'm thinking about it, and I could, I could see one of two things happening. I could see the New England Patriots looking at that, Bill Belichick getting on his team, maybe Tom Brady and crew thinking and feeling a little bit embarrassed, and they go out there and they dominate the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, I look at the Steelers. They've lost three straight games. They're almost inventing new ways to lose. They lost to the Oakland Raiders last week. So the question is going to be, which one of these two teams are going to come out more angry and more hungry? The Patriots are going to be okay. They're getting to the playoffs. They're going to win the AFC East. Steelers need this game. And if There's one week that I could predict that the Pittsburgh Steelers will show up and play hard and play their best game. It's this week. And they're getting two and a half points. So give me Pittsburgh plus two and a half at home against the New England Patriots. Game number four will be happening at 
Sunday night at 8.20 on, I believe, NBC. And it features two very powerful teams in the NFC, one of whom won the Super Bowl last year and is looking to get themselves in the playoffs, maybe a little bit of competition with the Dallas Cowboys. Maybe they're thinking of the possibility of maybe grabbing that last wild card spot, and that's, of course, the Philadelphia Eagles and the Los Angeles Rams, who have really been the darlings of the NFC this year. They go out there, they put up points, they got Jared Goff, they got Todd Gurley, head coach Sean McVay, and you figure it's going to be a matter of how many points the Los Angeles Rams are going to score this week. Sometimes we get sucked in when it comes to the lines of the game, and I'm going to admit that I'm guilty of it right here. The, the Rams are favored by 13 at home. Part of it has to do with the fact that the Philadelphia secondary has been injured. But I also look at the way the Eagles played last week against the Dallas Cowboys. And I don't think this is a team that's quit by any stretch of the imagination. They handled Dallas very well. It was a game that went to overtime. Clearly could have gone either way. And it was even a fluky play. The ball that was tipped up in the air and caught by Amari Cooper when he ended up scoring that winning touchdown. So I look at this and I believe that the Eagles could keep this game close. In the end, maybe the Rams win, maybe they don't. But give me Philadelphia plus 13 at Los Angeles against the Rams. Finally, the Monday night game. And it's been a while since I picked Carolina in a game. And you'd understand why if you follow their results lately. This is a team spiraling out of control. This is a team that was... Expected at one point to be a lock for a playoff spot. And it hasn't happened. They're playing the New Orleans Saints. The New Orleans Saints, a team that's in a very good position. A team that knows that if it can win out, they have a very good chance of having a number one seed in the NFC. Knows at the very least, if things don't work out, they'll have the number two seed. And I think if the Eagles can somehow manage to pull off an upset on Sunday night, which they may not, the Rams still may be able to win and not cover, which is what I'm predicting. The Saints can go into this game and not have to really play anything. If the Rams lose, the Saints can lose this game and still be in the driver's seat. The game means a lot to the Carolina Panthers, and it's going to be kind of the theme of my picks this week. I think of how much the game means for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think of how much the game means for the Indianapolis Colts. Not that their opponents don't care, but the game is very, very important that those particular teams win. So the Panthers, if they don't want their season to end, they're going to have to find a way to win this game. And if things end up going in their favor, like perhaps New Orleans doesn't have to go all out, they don't have to win the game, to still be the number one seed in the NFC, then I think that bodes well for the Carolina Panthers. Give me Carolina plus six and a half at home against the Saints. Recap of the picks. Jacksonville, 1 p.m. Sunday, minus seven and a half at home against Washington. Indianapolis, minus three, 1 o'clock p.m. Sunday at home against Dallas. Pittsburgh, plus two and a half at home against New England, 4 p.m. Sunday. The Philadelphia Eagles, plus 13 at Los Angeles Rams, Sunday, 8.20. And finally, on Monday night, give me Carolina plus six and a half at home against New Orleans. A little recap of the show today. The Hall of Exclusion, as opposed to the Hall of Inclusion. Harold Baines getting inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame. Nobody should be blamed, especially Harold Baines, as much as the baseball writers. The baseball writers have almost forced the Veterans Committee to undermine them and try to counteract what they have not done right for a series of years. Once again, and I'll go on my rant about this, baseball is the only sport that doesn't have the equivalent to their all-time hit king in its Hall of Fame. The guy who's hit the most home runs in his history is not in a Hall of Fame. The players that had the third and fourth highest batting average in the history of its sport are not in a Hall of Fame. The four players that have accumulated the most home runs in a season are not in its respective Hall of Fame. The guy who has the most MVP awards is not in its Hall of Fame. The guy has the, who has the most Cy Young awards is not in its Hall of Fame. The guy who has is one of four pitchers to 
to have 4,000 or more strikeouts in the history of its sport is not in the Hall of Fame. Nineteen fourteen World Series. Was it or was it not fixed? I think we should do more research. We should have more of that as a focal point and the reasons that perhaps the Philadelphia Athletics players may not have been on a level in that World Series. One of the biggest and the biggest upset in the history of the World Series. You got Boylan Boylan, the two assistant coaches, easy to confuse. You got Marshawn Brooks being confused with Dylan Brooks. Ended up nixing a trade that would have been involved with the Houston Rockets, the Phoenix Suns, and the Memphis Grizzlies. NFL picks, they'll be up on JohnPielli.com. Hope everybody enjoyed themselves today. Hope everybody has a nice weekend. Once again, this is the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. We'll see you next week. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.